uh, we want to welcome all of you to the first uh, National Christian Men's Week celebration. We want to start the program with a prayer and uh, we would invite a representative from the Methodist Church in Ghana, Brother George Opari Baby. Can you please come and share the opening prayer with us? Brother George Opari I see Tony from Assemblies of God, 
I see Presbyterians. I see Apostle from Church of Pentecost. Possibly they are Anglicans here, I believe, and Baptists. This should suggest to us that uh, our gathering here is a flavor of Psalm 133. It says, How good and pleasant it is when brethren gather together in unity. It is like the oil that has been poured on the head of Aaron, running down his beard, running down to the edge of his clothing. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on Mount Zion. And there the Lord bestows the blessing. So unity alone carries a weight of blessing and anointing which we are activating here tonight. Our meeting here is actually a culmination of several years of deliberate effort by Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship Ghana to reach out to Christians in churches and to bring all of us under a common umbrella to forge our energies together and begin a journey that will allow us to interact with one another and focus strongly on our common mission. On an occasion like this, it is only proper that we take good care to provide context so that we are not lost in the details. Why has Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International Ghana been at the forefront of this unity crusade? First, because of who we are as Full Gospel. We are a worldwide fellowship of some 7,000 chapters in over 162 countries. Our members can be found virtually in every Bible-believing denomination and we are some of the most active persons wherever you find us in any church. We have found ourselves in the business of reaching out to men and women in the marketplace for some 67 years. We've never had the intention of becoming a church and we will never become a church. We see ourselves as a servant of the church. Given who we are, if we are talking of unity of Christians, for practical reasons, we cannot be kept out of the equation. In fact, if we must provide further examples, in the charismatic movement worldwide, full gospel is seen as a common thread. The Sabend chapter of full gospel in Indiana was a strong contributory factor to the Catholic renewal movement as we have it today. You only need to understand our vision to appreciate why we are forging ahead in terms of providing, bringing all Christians together in unity. In our vision, we see a global movement of laymen comprising men and women, being used mightily by God to bring about the last great harvest through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see laymen. We do not see full gospel businessmen, fellowship international laymen. We see lay Christian men everywhere. We see them in our chapters. We also see them in churches. We all belong to churches. And the truth is that the work of the Lord, Christianity in the earth today, is the work of the Lord through approximately 1% to 5% of the body of Christ. The remaining 99 or 95% are like a sleeping giant 
sitting in our pews, listening to wonderful sermons, but we have forgotten about our mandate to reach people in all nations for Jesus Christ. I belong to Assemblies of God Church of Tony. I belong to the men's movements. I have one of our colorful dresses. I even have more than one. Uh, when we have a men's ministry day, we go out there, march around, and we have a slogan we respond, respond to. Men, action. Men, action. Men, action. Action, now. Action, now. Action, now, 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 now. But the action ends there. The women are more vibrant. The children, by the grace of God, are more vibrant because they are not looking at their fathers. But the men are seated in the pews, a sleeping giant asleep. And we all need to be awakened. And this is what full gospel sees itself as doing in these end times. We cannot continue to sleep at the switch. We cannot. The reality of COVID-19 is the fact that the end is nearer than we thought. When people talked of the Antichrist and the fact that we could lose some of our freedoms and the fact that we assembling in worship might be a challenge, we thought it a very distant idea. It just took COVID-19 to make us willing to trade in all the sacred freedoms that we had upheld over several centuries. We were ready to forgo going to church, ready uh, to forgo meeting together, and even more, do more, just because of a single pandemic. It should tell you that things are closer than we think. We are really in the season of the end time hours. Yes, the politicians, the economics, the sociologists can afford to fail. At best, they are handling human life and managing us for some 70 to 120 years. The church cannot afford to fail because we have the keys to the most important issue in the lives of men and women everywhere. The issue of where they will spend their eternity. We cannot afford to fail. We have the good news that lost lives and destinies can be recovered and restored through Jesus Christ. Amen. We cannot afford to fail. However, the truth we overlook, and it is sad, is that the gospel is not good news if people have not heard it. You can have the best medication if people don't have access to it. It's as good as no medication. So the gospel is not good news until people have heard it. And they cannot hear it until we go out. The church is not a pleasure boat. The church is a life boat. Friends, let me conclude by offering us food for thought. We have to go out there vigorously and pursue our mandates. We are not a sitting church. We are a going church. Our mandate can never be carried out sitting in our pews. We are the single organization that has at the center of its purpose the welfare of people outside that organization. We are interested in people outside the organization. So the church cannot afford to fail. It is not about God. It is about us. Let me explain why. Mark 16, 20 says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. The truth we learn from this passage and from the Bible and everyday experience in general, is that God moves when we move. If 
we don't move, God doesn't move. God could have spoken directly to Cornelius. He sent an angel. The angel could have spoken to Cornelius. He didn't. The, point, the angel pointed him to Peter. Because we have the privilege of extending a hand of the salvation that Jesus has provided to other people. We cannot afford to fail. If we fold our hands and sit contemplating our novels, nothing will happen. The Acts of the Apostle is called the Acts of the Apostle because they acted. It's not because they were sitting down doing nothing. Together, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International believes that we as Christian men can write our own chapter 29 of the Acts of the Apostles. And so tonight my prayer is that with this at the back of our minds, as we celebrate, know that we are talking of the lives of men. God bless you. Thank you very much, Baba. We have the key to the destiny of humanity. And uh, the challenge he's thrown to us is that as Christian men, there is a need for us to go out vigorously and pursue our mandate. For this year's celebration of the National Christian Men's Week, the theme that we have chosen is building tomorrow from the current generation. And what a better platform to use than the four gospel businessmen bringing men together to put our thoughts together and see how best you and I can help to build the, the, the kind of future that we need for ourselves as a nation. We want to take a short break after which we would introduce our panelists and I will delve into the, the, the theme and we have a panel discussion. We know there are some of our brothers and sisters who have joined us virtually at various places. Please, we'll give you the numbers and you can go on the Full Gospel Facebook page, put your questions there as the panelists are doing their presentations and when the right time comes, we'll make sure uh, we'll get a panelist to answer your questions. So we we'll go for the commercial break. We'll be back very soon. Thank you. Mighty warrior, great in battle, Jehovah. You know, she's small, big in Shall we welcome Reverend Dr. Cyril? GP Fajasi, he is the General Secretary of the Christian Council of Ghana. The Reverend Fajasi uh, is the Chairman for this uh, panel discussion that we're going to have this evening. And uh, we would like him to give us his opening remarks before we introduce our panelists. Reverend Fajasi, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Um, there was a slide mix up, so I came in a bit late. Uh, I believe I've been following it. Because this is the church of Pentecost. <coughs> it is uh, an honor to be made chairman of this very uh, important uh, discussion. Um, um, when I first heard about the topic, I thought it was most apt. Because in the recent past, we had a few. Can I think of my mask for a moment? That shocked most of us the whole. One was when a student, students went to the example and said, Papers that we were expecting did not, as we say in, in student language, did not land. And because of that, they went on demonstration. And they so demonstrated that some of them even 
uh, insulted their teachers, destroyed school property, and even some of them went to the extent of um, saying words to the president, which became a big issue. We all thought they should be punished. We all thought this was not the way we have brought up our children. And, um, but in the wisdom of the president, he said it should not be punished, it should just be portioned. But upon sober reflection, when you think back at that incident, you realize that it is not so much these children who had caused this problem, but they may have learned it from their forebears, from their parents, from their teachers, from uh, leaders of society, from opinion leaders, from the people who influence society. So we, upon reflection, thought it is important for us to sit back and see how best we can so raise our children that we will not get to the point where we got to the last time. And that is the reason why I think this discussion is so appropriate for our times. How do we groom the next generation so that they will be the kind of leaders that we want them to be? And so I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to chair the occasion. Um, as chairman, I looked, I looked it up in the dictionary. And it says that I am the one who sits in the chair. By this case, we are all sitting in the chair. But I don't mean it is that I'm the one who directs affairs. So I'll be glad to direct affairs uh, till we come to the end of the program. Um, I have some other comments, but I'll reserve them for, for last. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Reverend Pharisee for your opening remarks. As we have already indicated, our theme is building tomorrow from the current generation. I think the picture painted by the chairman clearly indicates the kind of situation we find ourselves in as a nation. Uh, somebody has said that the future is not something we enter into. It is something that we create. The kind of tomorrow that we want for this nation should be created by us. Uh, we have been saying that uh, being a male or female is a matter of birth. Being a man or a woman is a matter of age. But being a godly man or a godly <coughs> woman is a matter of choice. And that cannot be left to chance. If we want godly men and women to lead this nation when we have grown old, then we need to systematically develop or build that kind of future. And that is why we are here this evening to have this discussion. To help us uh, discuss this, we have to my immediate right, uh, Professor Joseph Osafwidu, who is the head of the Department of Psychology at the University of Ghana and also a member of the Church of Pentecost. He's a, a minister of the gospel as well. So he's wearing many hats today. Uh, to his right is uh, Apostle Emmanuel Ankrabedu. Apostle Ankrabedu is the director of Pentecost Men's Ministry, what we call the PEMEN, I guess. Uh, the Church of Pentecost, Ghana. We have our third panelist who will be with us in a short while, and she is in the person of Reverend Engineer Equia of Ripwaten. She is a minister of the Anglican Church, and she is with the Holy Trinity Cathedral. So, building the future from the current generation. We would want to start uh, with our, our discussion by requesting our panelists to give us 
Thank you. I think Reverend Jason too. By requesting our panelists to give us their perspective on the current Ghanaian situation. Uh, Professor is a psychologist, and we want him to give us the perspective from that of the psychologist. So, Prof, tell us something. Thank you very much, um, Sam, and uh, good evening, President, who are watching us via uh, TV and Facebook. I, I think this is a very important issue uh, for us to deliberate upon and then reflect on and inspire each other, uh, pick a few nuggets, and see how best we can turn our vision around, especially when we are talking about our young people. And then, of course, when we are talking about parenting and leadership in this nation. And um, from what I sit as a psychologist, a uh, couple of years now, I am very much interested asking questions about for example, the involvement of men in, in child rearing in recent times in Ghana. I have very much interested also in value clarification as a nation. And what are where our values? Which values, for example, do we really extol? And what kind of values are actually guiding the raising of our children, for example? And, and, and the first point I want to talk about is that I think that we, are, we have a value crisis. See, values are those very important, uh, if you like, issues of life that become a compass in guiding a nation's destiny. And of course, uh, in, in raising our children, pointing them out to very key issues of life and how they have to behave and live their life. When you examine the landscape of Ghana historically, you will see that a lot has changed. And somebody will ask, change for the better or for the worst? I think it depends on how you look at it. Of course, we have moved on as a nation with regard to so many things. But when you look at what, as a nation, we did extol our values, respect for authority, hard working ethic, respect for leadership, some of these values are getting elevated. We don't seem to see these values really getting inculcated in our children. We don't actually see some of these values even making way into some of the materials. <laughs> And governing and directing a woman 
Now, the one is interested in finding out what are we interested in looking out from the bank, like about the bank. We don't seem to be interested. We've had a lot of discussions on women because they are vulnerable, on children because they are vulnerable, but we haven't had serious reflections on the male man, the man at home, the challenges the man go through, how the man addresses the challenges, how they get involved in the raising of our children at home. We have just, one of my master's students just completed a thesis on father's involvement, very interesting findings, that certain patriarchal attitudes, for example, there's no need for a man to, let's say, help wash the clothes of your wife. It's the wife's, you know, responsibility to take care of the kids. It's the wife's responsibility to be, you know, a caretaker of the home. And so most men, for example, would go, would be found sitting under what we call a grandparent say, enjoying themselves and playing uh, draft or worry and other games. And the woman will be at home engaging with the children. Most men are better show are not very much engaged in, for example, the supervision of their children's homework. Mm -hmm. What does it tell us? Clearly, finally, from a psychological point of view, the child is not going to grow and get his or her emotions properly regulated. Because we understand that when men are very much involved in the raising of their children, it affects their emotional regulation. Number two is that their moral compass is built. Number three is that it expands their social connections and network. And number four is that such children often even do well in school. So, so I say that the Ghanaian landscape as of now, in terms of values and in terms of role and play in raising children, um, has a lot of questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Osafo Gadu. And indeed, he says we do have a values problem. You are watching us live from the studios of the Church of Pentecost, La, and we are streaming live on Facebook at FGBMFI Ghana. And same for YouTube, FGBMFI Ghana. And we are also showing live on Pentecost TV and Atinka TV. This is the first National Christian Men's Week. The first, and this is the year 2020, an interactive panel discussion with spirit-filled men, in quote, on the theme, tomorrow, building tomorrow from the current generation, building tomorrow from the current generation. Reverend Ikua, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. Rev, in your opinion, what is the current state of the Ghanaian Christian community? How would you access the current state of the Ghanaian Christian community? Thank you very much for the question, and good evening to all of you. From my, from my perspective, I think the Ghanaian Christian community today looks very Pharisaic in the sense that there's a lot of a portrayal of Christianity, but then on the inside, our behavior is not very Christian in terms of how we deal with, with, with each other. So if you look at our youth, for instance, I find there's a lot of apathy. There's a, a sense of, oh, you know, let's go to church and, and let's appear to be very Christian. But then when it comes down to going, showing up at work on time, they don't seem to make the relationship, the, the, the connection between the values of integrity and the values of the Christianity that they profess. So you go to a shop and the attendant is very apathetic. Um, disinterested really in the work that they are doing because the facility doesn't actually belong to them and yet they've been in church all Sunday um, praying and asking God to deliver them from a variety of issues so my take is that if we look at the, the landscape as a whole it's not authentic it's a, a play of Christianity 
but in actuality, it's not a true practice. <coughs> Thank you so much, Reverend Ikua. Now I will turn to you, Apostle Emmanuel Ankara Bedou. How would you assess the Ghanaian, the state of the Ghanaian Christian community from the point of view of a father? Thank you so much and good evening to all of our viewers. I believe we have a very serious issue at stake this evening. Now, picking up from Baba Mohammed's introductory uh, speech, I could see a disconnection, a disjoint between what we claim to believe and then what we actually practice. And many times, talking about the relationship that exists between the adults or men and their children, let me say fathers and their children, most of the time we dwell so much on maybe what we say to them. But like the educationists tell us, it is not what we tell them that impacts them, but what they see as true. And the reference that was made by Reverend Fayose that took place in the press recently about these students who were uh, in the way misbehaving in our language. Uh, it's a good conclusion that he made that the problem was not with the children, but it was where they learned it from. Because whatever they were portraying are things that they saw their fathers or their leaders doing. And seriously, to understand, they were even surprised that we were surprised. Because we, our children are a reflection of us. So if maybe you want us to make this short assessment of how the Ghanaian Christian community looks like, uh, maybe Pharisaic is a very soft word. Yeah, because we don't appear to mean what we say. And we think life rests with us because whatever we are doing is impacting on generations. We are laying foundations for generations. And talking as men, everything begins and ends with us. And our, our indifference and our silence is costing not just the present generation, but the upcoming generation. So I believe that men must begin to redefine our roles, must retrace our footsteps back to the cross, especially men who call themselves Christians, and begin to abandon ourselves on Christ, empty ourselves, and then receive him and take his strength and begin to act aright, at least for the sake of the next generation. Thank you, Rev. On you, you just mentioned, um, you talked about laying foundations for generations in very practical ways. How can this be done? We don't want this to be a talk shop where we walk away with nothing. How can we build foundations for the next generation? What exactly do we need to do? Thank you again. I uh, looking back in history, maybe just recent history, or if we take those of us just sitting here, we call ourselves adults. And we look back from the parents and grandparents that we had. And the time they took, they spent with us, let me use invested in us. Uh, can we ask ourselves, are we spending or investing the same time they did in our children now? Now everything has become commercialized. Men are chasing whatever needs to be chased at the expense of taking care of their families. Now during this era of coronavirus where lockdown came, which I believe God created an opportunity so that men can bond with their children. Some, some men were fed up. And I believe it was an opportunity for God to really bring us back to our roles. I was very convinced about that, that God said that this is what I left for you to do. But some men had a very low threshold for continuing that confinement. So laying foundation for generations means God now needs true mentors. Mentors who themselves have been mentored by God, who are relational. First, they are well connected with God. They are well related with God through the word and then through prayer. And they are broken 
inside out and they really know what it means to be an authentic uh, Christian man. In fact, somebody has said, to be manly is to be godly. If we really want to be true men, then we must be true godly men. And I believe when we begin to open up ourselves like that to God, His word and prayer, uh, that is a good step in laying foundation for the next generation. Thank you very much, uh, Apostle. Let me come to you, uh, Reverend Lukia, on this. I think uh, we are trying to look at how best we can create that kind of future for the current generation. We are told that we have various agents of socialization as well as our bringing of children is concerned. We have the home, the family is there. We have the peers that they grow up with. We have the school. We have the mass media. And uh, we will say the church as well. Being the minister of the gospel, uh, we have agreed here that we have a, a role to play. I would want you to take it from the perspective of the role that the church, as an agent of socialization, what can we do? You clearly identify the, 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 the Christianity in Ghana as Pharisaic. And therefore, what do you suggest that we do from the perspective of the church to help us to follow the current generation to get the kind of future that we want for ourselves? Thank you again for that question. So, I'll answer this using a, a, a text, and it's 1 Timothy 4.12, where it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I think as the church, the role we need to play is to help our young people to understand what it means to be leaders now. There's a sense amongst our youth that you can't lead when you don't have money, you can't lead when you don't have influence, you can't lead when you are not a big man. And so there's an attitude that their role now is just basically to mark time, to sort of wait and uh, hopefully over time when they are adults and when they or when they are more adult and when they come into money then they can have an influence but given that out of the seven days of the week there's one full day where one institution alone has the attention of practically everybody in this country i think that is an opportunity for us to teach practical things in church one of the complaints I get from youth all the time is that when they go to church, they hear about repentance, they hear about coming to faith, they hear about being born again, but they don't hear anything about the issues that actually affect them. The fact that they come from dysfunctional homes, the fact that they are struggling with school, the fact that they, they have so many challenges to deal with. So the role the church can play is to step back a bit from the spirituality, if you will, and come into some practicality. So if scripture says that set an example for believers in speech, then we must teach our youth what it means to speak like a competitive and respectable person. Many of our youth are comfortable with the idea that, oh, you know, I only speak English somehow, some way, because, you know, after all, it's not my mother tongue. But the question is, even if you go to their mother tongue, do they speak that at the level at which they should? Many of them don't. So the church has a responsibility to instill in them that our role as Christians is not just for our local sport, the space we're in, but we must be able to compete universally. Globally, we should stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. So what that means is, from a, if we walk into a room and we open our mouths to speak, we should not appear to be, oh, these are those people from that place. We should stand at par with people. And the church has an opportunity to teach these things in relation to scripture, so that the youth understand that these are not sort of corporate uh, principles. 
These are principles from scripture. So if it talks about loving people, living in faith, living in purity, the church must explain on a Sunday to Sunday and a really daily basis what that looks like practically. And not just an issue of you know coming into church and being ujashos and all those things are great, but it doesn't help to move our nation forward. Thank you very much. So what our Reverend Minister is telling us is that the church must begin to sit back and see how best you can come up with a, let me say, the holistic gospel. Yes. The holistic gospel. Now, let me turn to Prof. Since you are uh, from our academia, we want you to tackle the issue from the perspective of the school. How can we use the educational system to develop the current generation for the kind of future that we need for ourselves as a nation. Thank you very much. And so, sometimes I reflect on the kind of education I got right from kindergarten through to the secondary school and then coming to university. And one of the things that came up clear was that those days, we said those days, those days, I, I ask a few questions. What happened to the devotional times we had in school? Those were moments where very deep spiritual lessons came up. Ethical issues came up. Moral issues came up. Those were the times when students of particular behaviors, or students who engage in particular, uh, I mean, not morally reprehensible, morally encouraging behaviors were called for, for it. And, and they were they were showcased to the student body as examples. These are things to begin to look at. I know that when you look at, we, we've had several pedagogical uh, relook of our programs. Uh, I know the social studies book and religious education and all of this are there, but we may need to be a bit more intentional in designing and clearly articulating the fact that this is what we want the case to learn. Sometimes when we pick the books, there are so many of the issues totally here and there. I have thought that perhaps we may need an ethical education, for example, in our school. Um, we may need a moral education, uh, not, not just religious education. A moral education goes just beyond that. Okay, we may need that. What also happened to those days, like I said, children who were called for and were encouraged and were told that what they did was something that exemplary we should also uh, look at what happened to those. For example, we have focused extremely on intellectual education. <laughs> it's about the position is about who got an A, is about who got a B, um, is about who passed well in maths and who is doing well in science. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, when you take philosophers like Kami Gichi and others, they have reflected on this long before they pass on. That it's important for us to begin to build uh, moral education and ethical education into what we are doing. And not only to train the minds, but also train the heart and train the spirit. And so we may have to take a second look at this again in our schools and begin to um, award, begin to put premium on moral behaviors, begin to let our children see that this is exactly what uh, we wanted to do. I remember hard working ethic. In, in schools, those days when you sell a craft, you know, and, and, and you went in for a month. I remember teachers making comments. There were students who were not doing a class, but they were not just being trained intellectually, they were also being trained to build on their skills. And, and these were the things that would build values, like moral, education, ethical behaviors. So, perhaps we have to take a step at this. Thank you very much. So, looking at the educational system, 
not only training them intellectually, but morally and ethically. Uh, I was listening to a message by Ravi Zacharias, this Christian uh, apologist, and uh, he said he encountered a certain woman in the aircraft, a psychologist in the US, and uh, he asked the woman, if I were to send my teenage son to you, and there is only one advice that you can give to that son of mine, and my son will be very prepared to listen to whatever you tell him and uh, adhere to it, what would you tell the son? And the uh, woman psychologist sat down quietly and said, ah, this is a very difficult place. I said, no, I mean, assume my son said that whatever you tell him, he would do. She sat for a while and just said, well, I would ask him to get the best education he could. And uh, Ravi said, well, that is where the problem is. Because D.L. Moody once said that if you have a technician working with the railway lines and he's stealing the boats and the nuts, and you think that giving him more enlightenment and more education would help, send him to college he comes, he will sell the whole railway line. <laughs> what, what, what does he tell us? That yes, we can train them intellectually, but that is not enough. The ethical training is also so important. Well, thank you very much. We seem to have had our educational system focusing only on the examination that the children are going to write. If we do not train them intellectually, if we train them only intellectually and morally, they are deficient. Our future will be messier than what we are seeing now. Uh, Apostle, you've already spoken about what we need to do from the home. But I think we also have a challenge with the effect of the mass media on our youth. Uh, Auntie Pia, I hear you almost every Saturday morning. You, I, I would say you are somewhat a media person as well. So if you consider taking it from the media perspective and what we can do as Christians within the media, uh, to help train the current generation for the kind of future that we want for our generation. Thank you again. I think, first of all, there's a clear lack of responsibility when it comes to media. Oftentimes, there's almost a perception that, well, the media, you know, you watch what you want to watch, you, you have to manage it yourself. But we must remember that as adults, and as a church, and as a school, and as media people, and as whatever role that we play, we have people that we are showing an example to. Paul says we can do anything we want to do, but not everything is good to do. And therefore, there must be a collective sense of being more responsible about what is put out on the media by ourselves, and what we allow our young people to watch. Now obviously, as people get older, as young people get older, it's more and more difficult to monitor what it is that they watch. So this is why it's important for all of us collectively, when I say all of us, I'm talking about the education system, the church, to get our young people to understand the effect these things have on them. Many of our youngsters believe that, oh, I just watched it, and you know, it's not a big deal, you know. After all, it's not like I was sitting, I was sitting in my house, somebody was doing something and I was only observing. But we forget that that is how David ran into trouble. David started by just mere observance. And the next thing we know is people are being murdered, children are being born, you know, all kinds of things went wrong simply by what he saw. And so I think we have a responsibility to educate our young people of the effect that the media has on them so that they, they themselves are conscientized to the fact that it's not everything that you should watch. Because in as much as you may feel like you are just watching it, I'm sure a psychologist will confirm that there are subliminal messages that are deposited in our minds based on the things that we watch. And they affect the things that we say, they affect the things that, that we think about. And Christ has already informed us that once we thought it, we might as well have done it. And so it's only a matter of time before these types of, of negative behaviors start to manifest in our young people and ultimately start to manifest in our older people. Because as you rightly said, if that guy is stealing books, when he grows or when he goes to become 
and you know India. 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 <laughs> he's just going to steal the wrong way line. So this notion that, oh, he's young and you know, youngsters are like that, they don't change. We as human beings don't change much. The fact that you are adding years on doesn't necessarily mean that you are just going to change by virtue of the fact that you grew older. It is through conscientization of what scripture says. And I keep coming back to scripture because I feel as if our scripture is not practicalized enough. There's almost, in fact, there is a clear divide between the religious and the secular. And the question I always ask is, how could God create the whole world and then abandon about 90% of it to the, to the devil or to whoever and say that, oh, I only want to focus on the church? It doesn't make sense. So God is a part of everything. And we must make it clear to our young people that in everything that we do, there is an opportunity to apply the principles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Really quite thank you. Um, because you're sitting at the table of men <laughs> and speaking to men, permit me to be sexist. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> why, why is it important to you from the point of view of a mother, a woman, a, 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 a minister of the gospel, a professional, to see men called back to God in order for us to, to build the future that we desire? Because they marry us. <laughs> <laughs> That's simple. <laughs> That's simple. No, you know, it, it, it's because men are a part, they are half the family. You know, if, to, to form a family, you need a man and a woman to come together. So it's 50% of the contribution of any human growth involves a man. And I think the biggest culprit, honestly, in raising men poorly are women. You know, if you think about our young girls, all of us here, we have sons and daughters. When your friends come around, your son is, oh, Auntie Akosia's boyfriend, and Auntie Sewa's boyfriend, and your son is everybody's boyfriend, <laughs> but your daughter is nobody's friend. We protect our girls naturally from the beginning, and right from the very beginning, we start to instill in young boys the idea of polygamy, the idea of misbehavior, the idea of doing whatever it is that they want to do simply because they are boys. But girls are trained properly. Girls are always being, you can't do this, you can't do that. There are so many boundaries around women. And then that son, who is allowed to do whatever he wants, another son in another home is going to come and marry our daughter. And then when there's chaos and confusion, we are puzzled. Like, why is this man behaving like this? Because he's been trained by his mother and by his father that as a man, he's allowed to do whatever he wants to do. So, like you rightly said, there's a lot of attention that has been paid to women because women forever have been disenfranchised. But over time, it is men who are becoming disenfranchised because nobody's paying attention to the boy child anymore. The boy child is allowed to run wild and do whatever he wants. And then one day he become a man and supposedly become responsible. But how would that happen if nobody's raising this boy? So that is why I have a concern for it. Thank you very much. I think, let me just add something little to what she has said uh, in terms of the centrality of the role of man in the bringing up of children. I was sharing something with my co-moderator Kofi this afternoon. And uh, I think the last time we met, we also had some discussion on that. About a study that was conducted, this banner study, about uh, how critical men are as far as uh, God's plan of salvation and nature of children is concerned. Now, it comes to the probability of a whole family accepting Christ and going to church. It is said that when a child is the first person from a family, to get to know Christ first, there is 3.5% probability that the whole family will follow. If it is the wife or the mother, there is 17%. But if it is the father or the husband of the home, there is 93% probability that the whole family will follow. Now, given this, there is no way we can downplay the role of men in creating the kind of future that we need for ourselves. 
All of us here are coming from men fellowships from different churches. As uh, the vice president for Full Gospel told us, Brother Baba, in our church, our action for most of our local churches begins and ends during the men ministry week. Now, 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 and it ends now. <laughs> Maybe we'll go and sleep. Next year, we pick our uniforms and we just wash them and wear again. Come and march. Now, 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 and the now ends. Now, also for <laughs> you are the leader of, I would say, one of the biggest church, largest churches in Ghana, leading the men. Full Gospel is promoting this unity amongst men to make sure that we come together in a concerted effort to make sure we turn this, our nation, upside down. Now, I would want you to tell us how we can, so given the centrality of the role of men in God's plan of salvation and nation of children, how can we, how important, how significant is this our national uh, Christian men's association that we are trying to create, how significant it is as far as developing the kind of future that one foundation is concerned, and how can we sustain it going forward? Uh, maybe let me begin with a congratulatory message to the Full Gospel Men Fellowship International for coming out with this vision. Uh, for me, it is quite late in the day, but it is better late than never. Now, Full Gospel Business Men Fellowship stands at an advantage than other men fellowship because of obvious reasons, the donations. But Full Gospel Men have entry into every Men Fellowship, which maybe I would like to encourage uh, the leadership not to end the action now, but really to uh, put more fire into it after maybe this introductory phase. But before I forget, somebody has said, healthy societies are made up of healthy families. And healthy families are made up of healthy marriages. And healthy marriages are made up of a healthy man. The women should forgive me, they are also healthy. But everything now from the Bible's point of view began with man. In fact, God created man first and gave him all the authority and the rulership and other things. Then that work ratified the assistance of the woman. So women, I mean, uh, I mean biblically, came in as helpmates or helpers for the men. And men cannot check their responsibility with all the excuses that we hear and allow the women to carry all this burden, especially when it comes to child or children upbringing. Now, Prof was talking about education, but seriously, proper education begins in the home. Proper, in fact, the foundation for education is laid in the home. What happens in the four walls of a classroom is just something, the super that they are putting on. And if the foundation is not good, no professor, no teacher can better it. That's why we have very good academicians, I mean very good products from schools. They are well educated, but sometimes they end up well educated criminals. Because the, the moral base is absent. They can speak very good English, they have very beautiful signatures, but, but they use it for, for it. Now when you read Genesis 18, 19, God says something very significant to Abraham, which I believe, believe it is a blessing to all men. In Genesis 18, 19, God told Abraham that now I have chosen him so that he will instruct his children and the entire household after him to observe justice and righteousness so that what I have said concerning Abraham will come to pass. Now, whatever God has said will come to pass, but it will not happen in a vacuum. Men has a responsibility. So, uh, as I started with the congratulatory message, I want to say that this is something that we must put more fire into and really reach out to all the men ministries in all the other churches. And we, it's long time we wake up. We wake up. Not only during men's week, 
But throughout the time, we must lead our families at home. They must know we are leading from the front. And then the leaders in church, we must also show up at work as good leaders. Now, when you look in our, on our roads, for instance, and it rained just a couple of days ago. And then we are in a community, a society where there are laws about buildings and that kind of thing. It is not the number of laws that we have, but which of them are enforced? And who should be in charge of these things? And if we prolong these questions, it all comes back to a man who has a need on his responsibility. I want to add my voice that um, all men should wake up to their responsibilities, which God gave them right from creation, and which was renewed in Christ, the second heaven. Let us wake up to our responsibilities and stop sleeping on the job. And take responsibility that whatever happens in their family, right or wrong, we will bear that cut. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Apostle. Let us wake up from our uh, from our responsibilities, and when we say action, we should mean it. I'm going to ask um, my last question to uh, Professor Osafuadu, and once he's done answering, we'll be taking questions from the studio as well. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please prepare, and then you will have the opportunity to ask them. Meanwhile, if you are watching us on Facebook Live or YouTube, you can send us your messages as well and we will read them and our panelists will respond to them. So, uh, Professor, from the point of view of a psychologist, how can we or what can be done to prepare the minds of our citizenry, uh, citizenry for a future devoid of all the ills, some of which we have talked about and others that we haven't even mentioned? of um, spousal abuse, absentee, fatherhood, um, corruption, and all of that. Is it possible? Can we get the citizenry to buy into that thought that this is possible and we can do it and have a, 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 a nation free of those ills? Thank you very much. I mean, if you look at, for example, the past 20 years, uh, Interpersonal violence occurring at home alone has claimed over 8 million lives. Many of these deaths, many of these men who have a good loss control, one out of three women has been physically abused, one out of seven has been sexually molested. The, the figures are quite um, Disturbing when you look at what is happening in Ghana, for example. And then sometimes when you, you want to ask, are we close? Can we really deal with this? There are others who may throw their hands in despair and say, no, there's nothing we can do about it. That's not true. There's a lot that we can do. And again, going back to what the person just said, it begins from the home. We woke up one morning and saw. A minister of the gospel, supposedly, minister of the gospel, uh, killing a wife with seven long bullets, shot the person, and killed her. How can we address this? I, I, I just will uh, raise our prayers. So the first is that we have to start and take the discourse on raising boys seriously. That's one of the things that we have left unaddressed. How should boys be raised? Be raised. They should not just be raised as unemotional, unempathic. They should be raised to understand and feel as girls feel. What we have done over the, over the past is that we have had these gender norms. When boys are beginning to share emotions, they all stop. They are your boy, be strong. We socially so strongly engineer them such that they don't even learn how to regulate their emotions. And we forgot them. And whilst we are training a young woman to be responsible and to marry, we are not committing the same resources and time in a young man who will come and have their hands in marriage. The second thing we have uh, to do is to talk to men who are marrying at homes that provide the good examples. Provide the good examples. We have women, for example, who stay in marriages 
that are abusing all in the name of love and in the name of God hates divorce. Yes, God hates divorce, but God doesn't hate, for example, separation. So that you work on yourself and come back again. If you keep the kids in such a marriage and they are exposed to constant abuse, physical, sexual, verbal, whatever, what you are doing to your kids is that you are actually uh, you destroying your psychology, you destroying your emotions, you destroying the way they are looking at how a harmonious marital relationship should be. And the final thing I will just talk about uh, about how to address some of these issues is that it's important the church takes issues of men and talk practically about mental health issues about men. Look, we, we should not forget that the male man is exposed to all kinds of difficulties as the female man. And I'm using men here as generic. So women have problems, men also have problems. And we shouldn't forget the fact that the fact that a woman a man has a problem doesn't mean that he is so strong and he can overcome the challenges. We have a data showing that a lot of men in Ghana are very suicidal, for example. And they are suicidal for two reasons. One of them is that they get overwhelmed by demands that are placed on them all in the name that the man is a breadwinner. And the women are bread eaters. You know? <laughs> And the second thing is that the man becomes suicidal because of the expectation that he must, he must, he must show his virility, he must, he must perform in bed. Mm -hmm. And the third is that when the man goes through certain social adversities, we often say, oh, why well, man? He's a man, he can handle himself. And so men often don't get the compassion and the support they need. I think that if you begin to to, to address these issues and get closer to men. Men also have emotions. So that they can really address some of the issues that they're going through. They can, they can talk about it. They can share their challenges. So that they will not take that anger to the home and begin to mess up their lives, mess up their kids. I know that if a man's mental health is broken, the entire family is broken. When you repair the man, you virtually are preparing the time Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, I think Reverend Ikwa is itching to respond to that men are the breadwinners than women are the bread eaters. <laughs> we will take some questions right, from our nice. social media handles. Um, if you can read them, and then the panelists will respond to them. And then the audience as well, if you have any questions, please, um, you can just wave and we will call you. Okay, so please, you can come forward, or the, the microphone will be brought to you. I think we've had a lot of uh, great concerns from online participants. Uh, one of the key things somebody asked, uh, one George Sapo mentioned that, God bless you, great program. My concern is the fact that COVID-19 has kept our children indoors and doing all their homeworks using their phones, data, and almost all day they are on the phone. They are now going into pornography. Please use this forum to address this issue, especially we parents. How do we deal with our children now using their phones and they are even going to pornography? Reverend would you like to respond to that? <laughs> I think it comes down to the issue of talking to our children. You know, in this society, there are certain things that we, we don't like to address. We, we treat them as if they are a foreign input, as if sex was invented in the West and then suddenly um, imposed upon us as Africans, so we are scandalized that somebody would be interested in sex beyond having children. And so it's important that we start having open conversations. The reason why children, young people get into these things is it's taboo. It's unspoken about, it's unheard of, you know. But if we, they see us as parents and as adults and as a church 
sit with them and say, yes, we are aware of pornography. This is the, what pornography entails. This is what it does. This is why it is bad. This is the effect it can have on you. Then it stops being special. It's exciting because they are being bad. But if that badness is taken away from it, and it now becomes an open forum, where as parents, you sit with your child and have a conversation with them, an open and frank conversation where you're able to talk about the embarrassment of it, laugh about it, and have your child see you as a fellow human being who understands the changes that are happening to their body, what they are starting to feel, and what they are interested in, and so on. But the more we hide it and pretend as if it doesn't exist, the more we're encouraging young people to, to seek so that they can find the answers. But if you just put the answers out there for them, then they can make informed decisions and recognize that this pornography is not helping them, it is actually hurting them. Thank you so much, Reverend Prof, you want to add? Just a quick one. Um, and I think parents can, for example, uh, navigate through the search engines and place some senses in there so that children cannot reach <coughs> below certain levels. Um, apart from that, if you are home, you have to structure their, their learning. If they have a class between, let's say, 8.30 and 12, the computer is given. When we are done, you take it back. So, so a lot more of a supervision is needed now. If you are, you are having a problem, as well. I know those who are telecommuting, for example, you have to work and so maybe you are locked in some corner. Or you may have to go out of the house to the office. If you can get someone home to be supervised, the issue is supervision. So if you can, if you can begin to enlist the service of someone to supervise in your absence, uh, this shouldn't be a problem. You should be able to make sure that you get off this. Thank you, Prof. And, and I think additionally, there are software applications that you can install on the gadgets that your children use that can monitor and track the websites that they visit so that at any point in time you would know what they're doing, which sites they're going to, what, who they're talking to, and things like that so you become informed about their activities online. Thank you. We'll take more questions. Do we have any questions from the studio audience? Okay, so we'll take one in studio and then question and then we'll come back to our social media questions. Uh, Professor Sabu talked about uh, replicating values in our children. That is the ideal thing to do. But the question is, when the parents' values are negative, what happens? Then secondly, to what extent uh, do parents take responsibility for allowing societal influence to dictate their children's values? Okay, so, so the first question is, what happens when... The, the ideal thing is for our children, for us to replicate our values. So when your values are already in crisis, what happens? Happen. So, so, so we call on them, is a re-engineering. It's about, it's about correcting what went wrong. I mean, it's about going back to say, look, these were the values I have missed. It. So it is actually a hard on call to me. Now something is going wrong. We have to begin to talk about turning ourselves around. Because you see, there's no way you can give to your child what you don't have. And that's exactly what we're saying. If you don't have it, you must acquire it. And, and, then, and then human, the human nature, human nature is such that every human being has the capacity to learn. So I often hear people say, oh, well, I, I am beyond repair. That's not true, actually. Every human being can learn. Even animals can be domesticated to pick a few lessons from humans by simply providing them structured instructions. So people can learn. And we should encourage men who have problems that, look, you can learn. Get back to these values. Because you cannot tell your child what you don't believe. And you cannot give them anything that you yourself you are not actually living for. And central is that's the point uh, I have missed up now. Then the second question is uh, 
uh, how do we make parents take responsibility for allowing societal influences to dictate their children's uh, behavior and morals? How do we make parents take responsibility? Yes, for, I mean, most of our children are being influenced by society rather than from home. How do we make parents take responsibility for that lapse? Well, but my thought on this is that parenting is an act that must equally be learned. The fact that you have a child doesn't necessarily make you a parent. It makes you a caregiver. But to parent a child requires a certain level of skills and some level of complexity. And that's the reason why I have often said that it is not enough to say, I have children. You must also go beyond that and provide the requisite training, the structure, the discipline that the children need. And so I think that one of the things we can do can start with our churches. That's one of the things we're doing. That number two, we must teach parenting. Various counseling ministries in churches must take parenting seriously and begin to teach, begin to counsel, begin to provide some support for parents. People don't know, for example, how to even communicate and learn and talk about that. They don't know how to communicate issues on sex education with your children. It's so difficult. And if you don't train up the child, any other person and other, you know, social influences will train them for you. Those are my thoughts on this. Yeah, so we take the second question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have quite a few. I'll just answer that quickly. Um, first, uh, in terms of uh, when I think one of the panelists mentioned that um, some men are shaking their responsibility. Of course, there is pressure on men. And then I want to bring in the situation. This is uh, the women are what help us, help me. But the question is are the women really help me or they have become dependents? There's so much pressure on men today that. Everything depends on you. The women are not open. I'm not saying all women are not open, but some are not open. Instead of becoming helpmates, they have become dependents. Two, I mean, for example, personally, I was raised by my mother single-handedly. And even up to today, every morning she calls me. When we are done with conversation, she tells me, how the wife in the kitchen. So we have to inculcate these things into our men. But then again, in as much as we are doing that, we should also understand that the women are there to help us not to be dependent on this. You can't be raising children and be raising women at the same time. <laughs> um, two, I want to go to the issue of um, parenting, as you said. Uh, one thing, growing up, one of the arguments I used to, myself and my brother, we have to analyze Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Parents are quick to quote the first portion, the verse 1. It says, obey your parents in the Lord. But when you go to the verse 4, it says, uh, parents, do not provoke your children to anger. The thing is that even when we provoke our children, we are not ready to accept it or admit it. And that is what they are picking up from this. Again, if you go to 1 Corinthians 10 23, it says, All things are permissible, but not all are edified. Now, we look at our culture and our background. It looks like we are copying everything blindly. Gone were the days when you misbehave. Your, your, your neighbor will discipline you before your mother or your father comes back. When they come back, they will discipline you in addition to that. But today, they that somebody's child, and you'll be behind bars. So in as much as we are looking at modernization and every other thing, we should also look at our cultural perspectives. I believe that these are the things that is making us, or making our children go wayward. Because we have now become independent. We don't allow society to raise the children instead of I mean, we are raising the children individually instead of raising them as a society. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have some questions coming uh, from the social media handle? If no, then I think we would yeah. move. We have another question. Okay, then one, one yeah, more question. It has to do with when is the ideal time to start talking to children about sex and sexuality? Uh, <laughs> so who do we send it to? 
Let me just. <laughs> Let me okay talk from the perspective of a parent myself. Uh, when is the ideal time? Spurgeon said the question was once asked. When is it good for a man to marry? And the very answer given was that for young men it is too soon, and for old men it is too late. A man must marry when he's in the right position to marry. A child must be taught lessons when they are in the right position to understand those lessons. My children, when my, 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 I have three children, when the last one was three years, the second one was six and the first one was nine. I was sending them to school one morning, then the last one asked, Daddy, um, how do babies get into mommy's wombs? Then I just looked into the mirror and checked, realized that the other two were giggling. So I knew that no, they might have discussed the issue. I said, don't worry, when we come back in the evening, I will explain to you. Fortunately, I had bought some books that explain the whole process of a man and a woman, whatever, and bringing how children are formed. So when we came back in the evening, I sat them down and I took the book, I took them through that look. This is a man's uh, genital organ, this is a woman's genital organ, this and this is what we call sex, this and this. And this is how a man deposits pen into a woman's womb, so, 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 so. Now when the child is born, the parents are supposed to nurture, take care of the child and bring the child up in a way that God expects them. Then the last one who asked the question, ah, ah, that is, so that is why they have said that if you are not married, you should not have sex. Yeah. I said, yes. He has answered himself. You know, sometimes we shy away because of our culture, and she clearly said it. And what some of us have noticed is that some of us parents, we don't even know, let alone teaching our children. So I think we'll throw it to our, 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 our clergy. We need to make sure, I mean, we have the men ministry platform, the women ministry platform. These things can be used to teach uh, uh, parents how to uh, teach their children about sex. So that it doesn't become like uh, something too foreign. It is part of us as human beings. When the right time comes for you, you'll be engaged in it or you'll be involved in it. That is what I, I would want to say. I think we... We are running behind time. We would want to uh, ask our panelists, just in a, a, a minute, just give us your concluding uh, remarks. So we we'll start from Apostle. From there, we come to Prof. Then uh, Reverend Ikea, after which Doc uh, will give us his closing remarks. Thank you again. Now, I believe as parents, we have responsibility towards our families, not just ourselves, and especially as men. And uh, we need to rediscover our role and then our willingness as God created us to be and begin to take charge of the family and by uh, extension the society. Uh, we, we can't now following the discussions and especially the contribution from my brother uh, concerning the role of women. It is men who make women what they actually are. If a woman is very, very good and helpful at home, it depends on the space that the man creates for, for them. I want to encourage all men to affirm their wives, encourage them not just using words to comfort them, but practically helping them. And then men, especially speaking on a Christian platform, men must be Christians inside out. Because a broken man who is really dependent on God uh, is a man that can really be used by God. Men normally spend their time trying to discover themselves. Uh, I think it's better to discover the Christ in you than to discover in yourself. And when Christ is formed in you, then you can be formed in your dependence. And, and just two things on the, uh, at what point can you educate a child of society. I think there is no other question about that. There are two things of the to think with. Number one, is your child an early mature? 
if the child is an eligible child who is beginning to put on I mean, breast development and people are beginning to leave comments about the child you need to start uh, yesterday <laughs> because she's confused that people like this, you know, trying to make all kinds of uh, uh, approaches and uh, touching her and she doesn't feel comfortable. The second thing is that there are some kids that are very smart and they learn to read very early. So if a child begins to read very, very early, the child is going to be exposed to all of these things in some of the books that you buy that you are unaware some of this content are in there. So you, you, you look at some of these things and then provide uh, what the child is. Not too much, but just beautifully illustrated the processes. And then you inquire from the child, here's what you all understand. Sometimes they just want to just find out whether uh, that you will be talking about it. They just want to pull your legs. <laughs> and finally, with regard to the issue of uh, these days, we don't allow one of the young men will allow others to raise their children in the community. We are cautious because of the complexity of criminality in our world today. So we are cautious. Um, please don't be jumping into disciplining somebody's child. And you will run into trouble. But you can, for example, provide some support if the if you found your child is in trouble or talk to the parent and I saw your child in this. Perhaps he needs some help. Thank you. I'll address it from the perspective of the question about when to start talking to a child about sex, and I'll talk about it from the perspective of marriage. From the time children are young, we start telling them, oh, you, you'll be a doctor, you'll be an engineer, you'll be a scientist, you'll be this, you'll be that. And yet, career ends at the age of 60 or 65. Marriage, however, is supposed to be a lifetime venture. And yet, we wait till a person is in their 20s before we even begin to address the issue of marriage, which is the only institution in which sex is legal. So I believe that when we start talking to our children about you be a doctor, you be a lawyer, you be a scientist, by that point, we should be comfortable enough to start giving commentary about marriage, because you need to be discipled into marriage. It's not an issue of three to four weeks of marriage comes here and then you say I do before I say I do seminars and so on and so forth. Marriage is a lifelong institution and therefore young people from jump need to be talked to about what it is to marry them. Everything about marriage which includes the issue of sex which as our psychologists have said you bring it in at a time when the child is ready to receive it. Thank you so much, Reverend Pius. It will give us a closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I thought this has been a very uh, insightful and enlightening uh, uh, discussion. We have tried to look at how to create a good future for our young generation. Um, one of the key points that I believe came out very strongly is that we must go back to the word. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. These commandments that I'm giving you, uh, put them in your hearts, impress them upon your children, talk about it when you sit down, when you lie down, when you are going out and when you are coming in. I think we should go back to that. Train the child the way he should go and when he grows up, he will not depart or she will not depart from it. The other thing that, my other takeaway is that we have as parents, as leaders of society, we have um, a responsibility. We have a responsibility to take care of our children, to be in the lives of our children. As parents and as families and societies, we have influence. Someone said our children imitate us. They don't so much listen to what we say, but they listen to what we do and what we are. So we have so much influence. If you know the friends of your children, you know, if you hear the, the way that your children are speaking, you can know who they are associating with. Uh, 
if they are associating with you, they speak in a certain way. If not, they speak in other ways. And the third thing that uh, I also notice is that no matter how you look at it, at the end of the day, we'll have results. So if we, someone asks a person of, what if you, if you model bad behavior? If you model bad behavior, you're going to get bad uh, behavior come out. If you model good behavior, we're going to have good behavior. The other thing, take away that I also had is that um, this whole venture is a, a multi-sectorial, as we say in, in public uh, sector language, approach. The family has a role to play. The, the church has a role to play. We must move away from our Pharisee Christianity to a more holistic uh, Christianity where our Christianity is a Christianity of integrity. What we, we, we say outside is actually what is inside of us. Then it's also from an educational point of view, uh, the, our educationists must also uh, train not only the minds of the younger generation, but also their hearts and their spirits. And the prof emphasis on moral and ethical education, extremely important. And then the role of the media, the media must be responsible. So all of us, parents, the home, the church, the school, the media, and then we also talk about the centrality of uh, the role of the man in the upbringing of our children. When the man is involved, the likelihood is that 93% of the time will be successful. Something like that, right? Yes. Yeah, so we must do that. But my final is that is what Prof said. Take away is that we have a value crisis. We have a value crisis in our society to the extent that students expect to be allowed to cheat. That, 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 that is really, I mean, when we were growing up, we knew what was right and you knew what was wrong. And when you did it wrong, you came home or you stayed away in town till it was very late and you sneaked in piety to come and sleep. And even then, you were still punished for it. But it looks like now, there's some kind of confusion. And again, maybe the solution to that is to go back to the Word. Uh, go back to Scripture. Let us teach the commandments that we know to our children. And we believe that they have a better future. Thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. And thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Fayose. Indeed, we need to go back to the work. This has been a collaboration between the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship International and several churches, the men's ministries of several churches, including the Methodist Church, the Assemblies of God Church, the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, the Church of Pentecost, the Anglican Church, the Baptist Church, and we are so grateful, especially to the Presbyterian Church for the financial support, the Church of Pentecost for giving us your studio and for allowing us to air live on your TV station, Pentecost TV, as well as Atinka TV. We're grateful to the planning committee members and all our panelists, um, Professor Joseph Osafo Edu, Head of the Department of Psychology, University of Ghana, Reverend Engineer Ekua Ofori Boateng of the Holy Trinity Cathedral, Anglican Church of Ghana, Apostle Emmanuel Ankara Bedu, Director, Pentecost Men's Ministry, Pimem, Church of Pentecost, Ghana, and thank you all uh, for our guests in the studio as well, and all of you watching us live on Facebook, and on YouTube, and on TV. Meanwhile, this is not the end of the program. Please make a date with us on the 24th of October 2020, which is in about 10 days for a day of silent placards. All you have to do is to show up at one of these locations and be prepared to hold a placard 
that speaks to the ills of our society. You can join us at the Kwame Nkoma Circle in front of Cal um, Calvary Baptist Church, Accra Mall, West Hills Mall, Palace Mall, Makola at the Ghana School of Law, Agogloshi Market, Dansoman KFC, um, McCarthy Hill, Keep Fit Center, Pediasi Lodge, Keep Fit Center, Tete Kwashi at the Calvary Baptist Church, Shiashi, Adenta Barrier in front of the Adenta Police Station, Airport Junction at the intersection, the 37 Military Hospital, and the Damkwa Circle Usu. You can um, contact your, the, the leadership of your men's ministry of your church for further information, or you can call the following numbers if you would like to join us. 26 or 054-180-7346. 054-180-7346. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you very much, Kofi. My co-moderator, Kofi Boateng, I am Tony Arthur. We want to bring this program to an end with a closing prayer. We would invite Brother Dr. Kofi Asamoah, the immediate past Secretary General of the TUC Ghana. I'm going to <laughs> 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 We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for helping us to bring to the fore the challenges that we have and the crisis, the value crisis that we have. We pray that you continue to encourage us and ensure that any objective we set for ourselves will be achieved. We pray and also ask that you strengthen us in the other activities that we are here to undertake. We say this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming and God bless you. Have a safe journey. Thank you.